Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm Jess. And I'm obviously not Jess. And today Jess and I are going to be reviewing Videodrome, directed by David Cronenberg, released in 1983. Jess, I hope you don't mind, but I'll do the synopsis. You can, maybe. Videodrome follows Max Wren, played by James Woods, who's the president of Civic TV. He's looking for something new and controversial to show to his audience, but he comes across Videodrome and might find himself a pawn in a master plan. What's this, Videodrome? Torture, murder. <laughs> Sounds great. Jez, Videodrome. It's been a while. Yeah. I mean, it's a film I don't have any bad feelings towards, and it, but it's also not a film I'm like as fat, a lot of people get really. I don't know. It's the body. It's the body horror. It's it's Cronenberg. It's, it's people. It's Cronenberg. It, 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 he's become a verb. Um, it's it's a, <laughs> to it's, Cronenberg or not to Cronenberg. Yeah. Is the question. Um, yeah. You you know Rick and Morty make fun of it with their Cronenberg's episode. Cronenberg world. Uh, yeah. I mean it it, it kind of. It, and this is one of his big ones. I mean, this is one of the ones that See, yeah. critically did well, but yeah. financially did badly. Um, I remember watching it at some point. I think we both have memories of watching it as kids. I, Teen young teenagers, teen, I saw it as a teenager. Yeah, I like, must have watched it on Channel 4 or something, because I can't... I mean, just it, for any... Uh, international viewers, Channel 4 sort of... A, when we were growing the up... The fourth channel, channel we had. Yeah, yeah, it just come out, and it did a lot more of the international slash more adult late-night TV. Yeah. That was... Notable globally, so they they gave us some more uh, the cool indie films, which this is a cool indie film for the time. Well, I mean, it's... if I look back, a lot of better stuff's come out since. I'd argue in terms of what it tries to achieve, but it's still got a message that resonates. I suppose that's that's the argument. Well, like you said, Cronenberg is like a name that for what the last thirty years has just cemented itself in in movie pop culture, and he's still going. You know, I mean, he's got the new film with Viggo Mortensen that's going to come out soon. Yeah, he had uh, he had Cosmopolis that was coming out before that with you know Batman, and but you know I've I saw I saw Shivers first, and I'm a big fan of Rabid, and when I was growing up. David Cronenberg was that name as well. You know, the fly with Jeff Goldblum is just fucking sublime. Yes. And so I was just like, oh, you know, I've got to watch this movie because so much had been told to me about Videodrome. You know, this movie that was full of sex, full of violence. It made you question everything. And this was heavy in the 90s. You know, this is pre-Matrix where we started thinking that every black cat was a deja vu. And so I was eating it and up. And it it's a film of paranoia, like you say, with The Matrix, which is a film of some level of paranoia. See, now, like we're all puppets to someone else's yeah, game. This, but it's this, a parody yeah. as well, you know. Well, like, so, so I lose yeah. the message with with. Well, it starts strong in this film. I feel that the first half is pretty strong, but the second half begins to just lose itself. and The, the message gets The message gets a bit watered and, and lost. And it is designed to be a film that's multiple, one of those films you kind of go, oh, well, what's really going on? And you can go, it's real or it's just a hallucination of a man losing his mind. The man being James Woods, um, playing Max Wren. I, I'm a bit of a fan of James Woods. Yeah, he's gone a bit crazy in his later years, but... Um... It, well, that, like, he's always been opinionated. You know, yes. he's always been a strong opinion and he's got a career that just spans like 50 years ranging from, you know, massive blockbusters like Once Upon a Time in America oh, to bit parts like in Scary Movie where he's got the diarrhea scene. Uh, oh, the, yeah, the priest on the toilet exercising <laughs> demons. Yeah, if I, if I had to pick two randomly, it would have to be Michael J. Fox with him in The Hard Way and John Carpenter's Vampires, of course. But him playing Max Wren, he's he's the head of this TV station and he just they just need something. They really desperately need something to, to get the audience in to watch. And so he's got this is it Harlan? You know, the, the underground kind of yeah. secret signal guy, you know, the nerd that we always know. Yeah, helping him find his new edgy show for his channel. Yeah. And he's a man buried in kind of sleaze, so he's it's, kind of Well, well it's well, disturbing the things that like he, he's looked into. Like, the way that he finds the signal of Videodrome, you know, it's like 51 seconds. Well, you have to put before he, he that, with his, him and his two co-runners of the, the, the channel, well, they're on channel, they're on channel 76. Yeah, yeah, his partners. Yeah, they're partners, and they're just watching some Japanese softcore porn. And uh, they're, yeah. they're kind of like, talk, just casually talking about it, oh, it's just a bit tame. Yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's too polite. Um, and I'm like, I'm oh. looking at these TV execs, and they're looking at this TV show, and you see that giant wooden dildo. I suppose. Yeah. And they, they're talking about how soft court is. And then I'm thinking to myself, this, this is where I'm thinking executives do this. 
they sit in offices and decide what shows are going to be, you know, shown. You know, Max Max is meeting people in CD hotels and getting VHS videotapes. Yeah, it all it all feels very illicit. Like yeah. The, 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 the drug deal going down, but it's not drugs. No, it's no. A case it's, it's full of a case full of videotapes. Yeah, he's like, show me the last one. <laughs> That's just like, but don't you want to see the first? No, the last. I was like, what the hell? But he's looking <laughs> for something really dark and disturbing. And obviously this is where Harlan comes in with this show. And he's just like, look, and you're seeing this woman get whipped. And, and, and they're, and they're alluding to it being, a, you know, it isn't, it isn't held back from being, he's like, wow, their acts are really good. It's like, yeah, yeah. And then you're like, but then everyone's kind of, uh, Iles besides him seems to be very much aware immediately that it's more than likely a real thing going on. A real sort of snuff film. Well, yeah, Harlan but, is like a, a cold person I like I feel like he's the type who's detached anyway from society so I'm wary of, about him already especially if he's finding you know radio or well, video signals from yeah. Malaysia of people being whipped and killed and yeah. he's okay with it and Max is okay with it as well and, and then so... obviously but depending on the interpretation of the film you go through from this point um He's either quite a, a multifaceted character, or he is quite literally what he is from the very beginning. Because, yeah. as I said, at a certain point, this stops being reality and all is in the mind of the main character. Yeah. Uh, without spoilers, if you haven't watched, you really should now because we're going to throw it. Because this isn't a film. You, you, the spoilers are kind of the fact that you kind of like well, what's we'll, real and what's not. And we'll where try to stay on track. Yeah. You know. But this film is. This film is as you roll from this point on. It gets weird, but that's Cronenberg for you. He meets up with Debbie Harry. At, in an the, interview, at the, yeah. it, the interview, playing Nicky Brown. And he also meets Oblivion at that point. Yes, through the TV uh, signal, um, played by Jack Creeley, Dr. Oblivion. And they're discussing about Max's TV station, you know, how they're trying to break, you know, all these rules and regulations. And taboos, what they show. Almost, the taboos that... And... Are they corrupting society with Like, their... Nicky's kind of mm. in on it. She likes this kind of stuff. And Debbie Harry plays Nicky brilliantly. Oh, she's beautiful. She, she you know, she doesn't beautiful... have many roles after no. this, Debbie Harry. Uh, you know, she would just be Debbie Harry after this, you know, lead singer of Blondie. But in this, Nikki Brand is broken. You know, we're, we're like, like, we're not even jumping too far ahead, but they start to date, you know, and they start to see each other. And, you know, we have this, well, we might as well go to it. We have the sex sequence. James mm. Woods, Debbie Harry lying on the floor and he's piercing her ears. Yes, and it's while watching video drone. Yeah, and it's it's there's a kinky kind of there's a dark edge to them both at this point, and he seems reluctant. But again, as we said, yeah, this, he wants to. From this point, but he's yeah. he's like, oh, am I wanting to make that step? And I'm like, yes, you are. Yeah, you know, of course you are because. The, the age of taboos is gone. It's do anything you want yeah. in the privacy of your own home. Um, <laughs> But that that is kind of the point, I think. And this is where the film, from this point, quite literally on, anything is going... You're not quite sure what's real and what's not. Because it's acknowledged that he's hallucinating at a certain point later. Yes. But that may be within a hallucination. So you don't know if it's real or a hallucination or yeah, a hallucination. Like, and you're like, oh my God. From, from what we understand, people are investigating where the signal is coming from. And he's got his, his friend, Marsha, um looking into where the signals come from. We learn it's coming from Pittsburgh. Yeah, initially he thinks it's somewhere in Malaysia, but then yeah. it turns out apparently it was bouncing off satellites. And... Go, go into pit, coming from Pittsburgh. And so he, he sends Marsha to go in to have a look at this. And then he starts to get information, obviously, to look into uh, Dr. Oblivion. So he heads to the, the cathode mission run by um, Dr. Oblivion's daughter, Bianca. And... The homeless people walking in have to watch on TV before they can eat food. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a super. See, this is this is where you're like this. Just seems they're to... trying to. Well, they're trying to show people video drone or show people the no, effects no, they of video drone, the are, effects of TV. It's effects of TV, I think, because this is where who puppets who. Now, if you're going to look again, peel back the layers. Yeah. She is a puppeteer to arguably pushing. Oh, well, yes. She's, she I, she, is he's in warned, it on her own He's warned by well. Bianca that he's not ideological. But the, the Yes, because there's the idea Oblivion that this is has got ideological. Some, yeah, Videodrome is more than, was it they say, Videodrome is more than just a, a, a show. It's a philosophy. It's a way of thinking. But it turns out Bianca and her father weren't so much in for that. What Videodrome is, is a twisted version on their imp their vision of 
well, the new Flash. Yeah, which, kind which of like is where the, or- the film kind of yeah. does lose me a bit, because I'm like, the new Flash? What are we in at the moment? You yeah, know? well, the idea that you grow a new organ to watch TV, um, or absorb information optically, so it's all covered through the eyes, which is why it kind of links into the guy who runs a, later on, will encounter a hallucination, or a villain, yeah. of, the, villain yeah. of the piece, who is an optician. Um, so, and it makes sense that if he's hallucinating or wandering into opticians, seeing the head of the opticians, uh, then he, he links that to a villain and it's all through the eyes. So again, it's, it's confusing, but it's kind of wavy. Well, and it's at this yeah. point, again, as we Max said, Max is given more videotapes given to him by a, a work colleague. And he has that weird hallucination where he thinks he's hit her, but he hasn't, you know, and he, you can tell that Max, James Woods is obviously brilliant in just showing he's not slept for days. Far too much traveling, you know. He's he's obsessed with finding out more about Videodrome, and you see him sat there on the sofa with a gun, you yeah. know, topless. Well, the, the thing is, we there is a the, the tapes he's given. He immediately goes to remember first yeah. the pulsing yeah. videotape. Which, yeah, because he gets wake up videotape from his secretary every morning. It's going to brief him on the day, which yeah. is w- weird. But I guess this man. That's the point, though. He lives in. He lives in television well, world. Even yeah. his communications with his secretary are through a videotape. So I think that, that again, is an intentional, quite blunt way of pointing out this man's obsessed with television. Well, the I mean, the effects of him when he loses his gun inside himself... Well, the, the tape slot that's yeah, in the belly. It's like, he starts watching the red line appear. Yeah, I'm like, what... what? It was really good. You know, he, he, he like, the effects are, are just brilliant. I mean, you, you slightly notice the arm, you know, is not a real arm, obviously, yeah. where he's had it tucked in. But it's so brief. Cronenberg only gives us a few shots where when he loses the gun, you have that moment from James Woods then realising, oh, shit, it's got to be round here somewhere. This must be a hallucination. And then realising, no, the gun is actually now lost in you. And so he goes back to Bianca to talk to her about the hallucinations and the headaches. Because she said in the tape that's triggered this to some extent, but she, he had a conversation with her father in the hallucination. Yeah. He goes back to Bianca and he starts to find out information that it was her father who, who died, you know, on the operating table, but he was involved with two other people on top for, uh, you know, for making Videodrome. And like you said, the message starts to get a bit lost to me where through watching this or hearing about this film growing up, the kind of hip- hypocrisy, I suppose, well, the man, the... of TV is, you know, evil and it's filled with all this bad stuff. But the future that we live in now, present day, is actually fine with it. Well, it's, it's interesting know? this film still has a resonance. I'd argue that's where I give it credit because it is talking about the the kind of puppets we are in our own lives. And it, to be honest, this is probably the biggest problem with the film is Wood's character is a man without agency. If you, he's well, in, yeah, he's, a, he's in a his, own, his own. No, but, no, no. But, uh, everybody's pulling once, his strings. He's, what, yeah, he's what, pulled he, between Videodrome and Bianca for the remainder. Well, uh, um, Bianca. Well, because he, he's obsessed, especially when he starts to find out that, that Nikki has gone. He has that moment in his apartment where Nikki has signed herself up to Videodrome. You know, she's got a dark side. Well, and she, she wants she, to yeah, go, she, and he knows but something been, bad's going to yeah. happen to her. And then when she's gone. There was a love, there was a, he was a bit in love with her, I suppose, because they, he probably kindred spirit kind of well, character. he's obsessed with her. And but you're not seeing sh- her reveal herself from killing Dr. Oblivion, you know, that's well, when he's now thinking, I need to go deeper. I need to find out what happened to Nikki. I well, need to that's find out what's problem. behind you're Video Drone. Sure. I need to find yeah. out what the whole point is. And I sit there at this part of the movie going... Yeah, I suppose I, I've got two as well. But it's all in his head, maybe. But is it? He maybe have never know? met Nikki. This is where you start layering the film, because they met at the studio with the interview, where they're talking about his channel. Maybe they never met again after that. It's that, all well, desire well, the of moment, the woman. Because once he uh, because he gets invited by Barry Convex, uh, the other creator of Videodrome, to um, investigate his hallucinations. Hmm. So when they when he goes to this opticians, he gets this giant helmet to record thing his hallucinations placed on yeah. his head to record his hallucinations. And I did read that James Woods uh, was so concerned about being electrocuted, he said no to it. And so the guy wearing the helmet is David Cronenberg, <laughs> and it's he he gets it all focused in, and then Nikki comes into the room, and I know at this point I'm like she's dead, 
the girl is dead. This is not only just a hallucination, this is Videodrome using her to make him do more of what they want. And so you have that moment where he starts... And it's weird because he's gone straight her. from... He's gone straight from seeing Oblivion's daughter to there. Mm. And she was trying to give him advice, but then it seems irrelevant that he'd go see... Well, he'd immediately kind of trust the people that she's warning him not to trust. And it, <coughs> it just seems he's a man who's bouncing through his own narrative, yes. which makes me feel like if this is real, which we'll go with the principal argument that it is, and we're following the narrative of this reality, then he's a man without agency because he's now a puppet in the hands of others. And that, as you see for the rest of it, with he with, is... with, a, with an idea himself to find out what more of this is going on. and uh, Because once, he, once he's seen Barry, and you don't see him take the helmet off, no. You don't see him take the helmet off after he's dealt with his friend Marsha. You know, he starts to whip Debbie Harry in the same room that we've seen Video Drone being filmed. Yeah, it's what room is it quite that's, that's And then Debbie mentioned. Harry becomes her T V um self, which we'd seen before where they had kind of made love. Yeah, he made love in to the, the front TV. room. And it's making that TV. It that is a metaphor was... of making love to a television, which is that technology becoming the, everything to you. You love technology. Yeah, yeah you you have to be ever part of it which is, it is which crazy. makes me think of kind of like reality tv or people who kind of might obsess over well it definitely being via tv to being on the screen all yeah. the time and it is the love of the tele you know it's the love of the media which is again stripping away the technology of that era which is vhs yeah. and uh, yeah yeah which is which like i said it's just it's funny it's how <laughs> where it was at this point with videodrome and how it's advanced to the point where we carry literally these things around in our hand that tell us all this you've stuff. got a machine that a phone that's a little smaller than a vhs tape hopefully because some phones are massive but it contains a billion VHS it's, it's every day. It is video drone. ticking over. Yeah. And it's like you can watch any film you want through streaming devices through it. And it is it is now an extension of us. You're going to think how people are inseparable from their phones. So you end up... Oh, I'm, with... I'm good. I can put mine down. I could kick mine in the river. I'm fine. <laughs> well, we grew you know, up... If, we, we grew if people up didn't a... need to get hold of me, I'm good with that. Well, that's that, the thing. But... In, we grew up... We are probably the last generation because uh, we're both... You know, like thirties. I, I think it's we're probably the drum. last generation that lived without phones, and were you know, n and we ha we escaped that burden because we kind of. I think I, it's video drum that did that to me. You know, mm. it was look, you can't watch too much TV because look what it did to this guy, and he. You Although know, the ending, no, I remember watching it as a kid. And I thought the ending was. We'll get to the end when we get to the ending. Well, but Max the ending has obviously is, met up with Harlan yeah. at this point and realised that Harlan and Barry are both in on it. And he also realises at this point that there was no actual TV signal. Harlan has been showing him videotapes. So supplied by... Supplied by Barry. So so Max is, it, Max is infected, or, you know, Max has got the same disease that Oblivion has. But nobody else has? Nobody else has watched any video drone? No, because the tapes have all been supplied manually. There's no signal. Because why would they broadcast a signal? Well, we so, were, we were discussing so the, this before before we we hit record, but it's like with what happens to Barry because they push they they push Max to the point where now he is now an assassin, and they say, "Look, yeah, we Mancuri want you to kill your partners." Like, uh, remember, this is the Cold War era, so there's yeah. there's paranoia about the people controlling you. Um, the television signals are getting your brain. You still get that yeah, in yeah, America yeah, yeah. with conspiracy theories about. You know something in the water. This oh man, yeah, no, they, they they could find me anywhere signed into Microsoft. You know, but it's he 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 gets that gun. I mean, the the special effects by Rick Baker in this movie. Well, it was nice stop motion. You know, motion, just it? watching the gun become part of him. The, yeah, the the drills almost carve through his yeah. flesh. And now it's like and the prosthetic once he's I, got I it. I sit on there his and hand. I'm like, that's all him. That's what that's we. If we were to see it in real life, it would just be his hand and a real gun. You well, know, that's if it's what not. We, yeah, what yeah. we see at the moment is all this pipe work, and that's all in his head. Is it? Yeah, I mean, is this whole thing not just one <laughs> giant fucking hallucination? But he walks, he walks straight into his office, walks up to his partners, bang, bang, 
giving you know Barry and Harlan access now to put video drone on the TV. It doesn't make all that much sense killing two executives and having the third one done for murder because how are they going to get stuff on this channel that's now probably shut down? Well, so, Harlan might. So the print Barry might, might buy step in. He might and buy, buy it, it, I guess. I but guess. it is such a loose, unclear plot at this point. Because it what makes, is the what and is it, the, that's where it loses it because it makes you realise oh this is probably has been a hallucination of an eighty percent of this film. Like what is video? What is the plan of video drone? Is it to control? All the mass population well because that's after, the thing because, yeah yeah just because before then you've got the to... yeah the, but just before that they're like but before they reprogram him we're trying video, to change america they push a videotape in his chest and go yeah we're, we know your deviant channel serves only deviants those people on the internet that want to watch horror and gore yeah. and, oh wait hi guys <laughs> 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 so you now you now have these you know the uh the uh subversive masses viewed as scum that are corrupting America and we're going to use this as a weapon to kill you um, or control you you know so, yeah. we, so we're going back to the 1950s so they're reprogramming him which it, appears to have been the trick all along um, because they force him now to go and face Bianca yeah, you know, they, they want, want Bianca killed, and when he goes, Oblivion to needs to die. Yeah, when he goes <laughs> to confront Bianca, you do have that really great scene where Bianca says to him, "Like I knew it was you," because she'd said to him on the previous meeting, "Like, oh, you're here to kill me," and he's like, "No, no, no, of course not," and he he was innocent at that point, but now you know he's there to kill him, uh, kill her, and she lures him into the room and plays him a videotape of Nikki being killed, which, like I said, I at this point had already known that. Yeah, but the, this know, is the other she, thing. She it's was the going to Videodrome. Yeah, but Videodrome... She, she, was, she yeah. was dead, dude. She was dead. And yeah. So, for some reason... Um, or never went Max there. Never existed seeing at this, all. <laughs> Max seeing this image... They used her image to seduce you, but she was already dead. Now back away. I stole it from them just for you to see. And so, in confronting Bianca, the TV... Uh, comes to life and shoots Max in with the his chest. own sort of gun. It looks like yeah. his own arm pushing through a skin like. And so the, the the spell of Videodrome is broken, and Bianca then convinces him that now he. Well, has it's almost to go reprogrammed. Face... He delivers her line. Yeah, which long is, live the new flesh. Death to death to Videodrome. Death long to Videodrome. live the new flesh, and it, it, it's almost cult like. And at that point, it references back to having an ideology, which he, you you don't have an ideology. They do. Yeah, and they're dangerous for it. And it's he that was his um. Woman who clearly headhunts new pornos or yeah, yeah. whatever for Marcia, him. yeah. Marsha. Um, and yeah, so you kind of like, okay, so he was warned about this. And Marsha's like, this is dangerous stuff. You don't yeah, want to get yeah. mixed up he, in. He, he... And the problem is he's now a puppet of, to some extent, Bianca Oblivion. Death to video drop. Long left the new flesh. Because he's now spouting her and her father's well she has to use it now against him like does she break does she break videos video drums control and input her own or does she just break it and give him the chance to fight back because he goes and confronts no, the way he, he confronts he... harlan first and harlan oh, tries cool. to interject another videotape into him which is now just a fleshy mass and when harlan pulls his arm pulls out. his arm out you know his his hand is missing and into a grenade a yeah, grenade. yeah. Well, I, I didn't know it was a grenade at first i'm like what is that thing on it, his it's a, yeah it's, it's a, a fleshy block. i think it, but he stumbles back and then just blam against the wall and, and the like, wall Shit. explodes out and here's where it's weird yeah he, he just kind of steps out like a like a cartoon character yeah and then the woman in the street with a child ignores them the fact that the wall's just detonated outward and a man's wandered out into the street. This is like where Matrix, like yeah, it's all becoming yeah. a little bit like I think it's intended to be a hallucination. Because then he goes and confronts Barry, and Barry is giving his showcase of his new optical glasses, and it's obviously all majestic. And it's dancing. referencing to the pa there's the quotes you know, they, seeing the eyes. They you know, attribute the eyes to the it to one guy, but I looked it up, and the quotes aren't really actually attributed to the like the eye of a soul. The you know you can get access to all through the eye. It's referenced in the Bible and somewhere else. Um, and it's neither of them a reference to the um name of the show, which I completely mm. forget now. But um, it, it it's all platitudes, and he's kind of celebrating his eye. He runs like he's one. He runs an optician's like as a front thinks, operation yeah. for a government show. It just seems a bit ropey. It it it, it seems like I said. It seems to a point where you're like questioning: Is this real or not? To the point where Max confronts Barry on stage, shoots him. And then while he leaves, Barry just kind of... Detonates in tumours. Yeah. 
And I, I, at that point, when we were talking about it earlier, about him being I mentioned tumor, yeah, it was... I was just like, has he fully been just watching? He he's so into no, video, but he bro. said he never watched it. I think he took. But then a, why explode? Like Oblivion's that? tumor went missing, and the power of whatever was in Oblivion was stolen by that man. Right. Oh, that's the. See, that's where yeah, like I said, it lost and the, me, and I was just like, I, again, I understood what they were trying to do, but the problem is, as I said, it seems like the real world and the fantasy world. It's all in his head. It's very... It's, whether or not he's it's committed those murders... Existent, existent, yeah, whether I or mean, not, existent yeah. would follow the same kind of Because he executes line. him on the stage and then delivers again, death to Videodrome, yeah. long live the new flesh. And at that point, he is clearly cult-like towards Oblivion's idea. But what is the new flesh? Is this now uh, the well, that's what new didn't explore type it. I of, kind of exp- TV that they're going to be showing? Or no TV well, for anybody? Because that didn't yeah. really happen. Well, he, his arms changed and his body changed, so I imagine he was going to mutate into something grotesque and Cronenberg. Yeah, because he, he, es- well, he escapes out into the harbour and finds this boat. To, yeah, it's derelict boat, yeah. Because he can't go anywhere. You know, He's wanted by the police because of the death of his partners. He's just killed like two more people. And it, it's like at this point where he, he's happy to kind of die, I always felt with this ending, because he sat there and he sees Debbie Harry come again yep, through the TV. TV. You know, so it's kind of like, oh, she's back. I'm, you know, I'm still in love with her. And she, she says to him, like, you know, the best way that you can obviously become the new flesh is to get rid of the old one, which you're like, yep, suicide. That's how this shit always works. So the TV plays out a suicide. And... Which is brilliantly yeah. filmed. I do love this whole angle because I was watching the ending and like I said, I think watch watching apparently it for the third came up time, with this, yeah. the ending is just to the point really brilliantly filmed. You know, you see Woods walk towards this fire and then blam. Mm. And the TV just explodes in gore and intestines. Long live the new flesh. <laughs> And then the film sort of ends. It's But it's, does it? It does is Does the film end or well, do you sit there thinking about it for hours after like Cronenberg? No, that's the problem <laughs> I think. I think this is where this film stutters a bit at the end. I think it's heavy handed with the messaging maybe, and that's mm. probably you, you, it makes it too clear it's a hallucination near the end, I feel. And that's my opinion. I mean, I'm sure you can interpret it as a real world if you wanted to. That's the You choice. can interpret it on so that, many yeah. layers. But I just, the I way you have him walk out with. the back of the optician when he blows up the back wall after um, making the, the fist grenade. Yeah. And nobody else seems to pay attention. So it's as if he maybe killed him, maybe he didn't, and maybe he didn't kill him in the way we think he killed him. And again, or maybe he's not killed anybody, and he just blew, you know, he blows his brains out alone in the river. <laughs> I mean, the man's lost his mind, as it were, because... Watching too much TV. Yeah, too much TV, which is a sort of... This is all very heavy-handed and very exuberant way of telling you that. So, so uh, from, from the sounds of it, you're thinking it's like a, like a really disturbing American psycho. Yeah. You know... That it was just all in his head to the point where he just... Well, from the interview at the very himself. beginning of the film, TV interview, he meets Bianca. See, now, and that's the only time he meets her. Well, and the if, rest of it's a, a sexual... He lusts after what her. What if the point where he saw Video Drone... Because he saw Video Drone before he goes to the TV station. He meets up with Harlan right at the beginning. You know, he meets up with, the Chi- he meets up with those Chinese guys. He shows it to his buddies. He walks down to Harlan. And Harlan goes, here's 51 seconds. And that 51 seconds is enough to pop him in the head that everything, for, like you said, from that moment yeah. is now just one massive hallucination until he doesn't know what is it real anymore and he sits on a derelict boat and just blows yeah. his brains out. Yeah, yeah, could be. And that's the thing. And I mean, and th- that's the problem in a sense because you don't feel it as agency in the late, latter half because he's a puppet to other people. Or he's just lost his mind. Yeah. And I don't know, it just doesn't... There was something... The, the ending felt anticlimactic because... It felt like a suicide instead of feeling like the birth of something new. Like he'd saved the universe or something. Yeah, instead of tricking us so there's like an, un- an ambiguity, it felt too final. Yeah. And I think that makes you feel a little, even it, whichever way you want to interpret it. it. I remember watching this. This is one of the clear things I do remember about watching this film when I was younger. I didn't like the ending because I felt it was unsatisfying. Mm. And I felt it. It, that doesn't link into the, the, the grander narrative of television or movie or the sucking you in. This, mm. in a sense, pushed you away. 
Which, eh, if Cronenberg intended that, that's fine. But again, artistic interpretation. But if he did intend it, no. then you don't like yeah. it. Yeah, and I think I think that's where a lot of people may find this film a little chalk and cheese because, let's be clear, it's well made, well acted, well produced. The the gore effects are pretty funky. The prosthetics are pretty wonderful. Well, but it doesn't come together quite perfectly at the end. And I can see why the reviewers were positive to it. Yeah. But mixed in some areas, and the viewership probably fell away from it because. At a cerebral level, you've got a lot to talk about here, which again is the art of film critique. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. The moldable layers. Yeah, we can dig into it. We're but then when you with... actually look at it and take it apart, you go, oh, it's really simplistic and actually doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, it's like... It's like, know, a, like a little puzzle box. You're like, oh, oh, I've done it. Yeah, it's a car oh. engine that's not quite turning over right when you well, put it back together. What are your favourite scenes then, Jez? I think the fist grenade is pretty awesome. Yeah. And anything, but to be honest, it's the body horror, which is why we're here for, you know, old crony. Um, it, it's what Cronenberg does best. It's, it's, uh, it's the bit where you suddenly twitch because it's like, oh, there's a slit in his yeah. belly. And you're like, what's yeah. the red line there? It's like, oh God. And, and it it's something you... that shocks you to the point where you're like, oh, I'd hate that to happen to me. Yeah. And that's what this whole thing is. It's butterflies in your stomach. Are they, is it a videotape? Yeah. Oh no. And, and you know, like him losing the gun in his belly and then recovering it later in the film to execute the TV execs. I mean, it could have been on his person all the time. It was probably just tucked in a yeah, shoulder yeah. holster, which he actually shown to be wearing yeah. while he's sitting on the settee. And it could well be in the shoulder holster, but he can't see but it. But he can't see it until because... he needs to see it because he's mad. Um, <laughs> and again, these. I mean, like I said, it's not a dumb film, but it may be a little too self-important. Oh. Well, Austere. It, it's just, it just doesn't quite reach it. But like I said, I think all the body, the body horror, horror stuff, stuff is definitely great. Um, and I quite like the kind of strange bit with all the hobos watching uh, TV because it's so <laughs> at the, surreal. At the church, yeah. yeah, it's too surreal to be real almost. And the idea that you've got this rich woman running a charity that feeds homeless people, but then makes them watch TV at the same time. <laughs> And, and and that's where you're like, um, um, if this world's real, then it's all pretty weird. Yeah. And that's beyond conspiracy. I mean, surely somebody on the new local press has been like, that's a bit strange. Well, Nobody's is it causing it. any harm? That's, that's yeah, the question. Or are the cops in on it? Well, what's your favourite scene? I, I, have a f I have a few. Max beating the woman, uh, Bridie, when she comes to his apartment. I just love the, the cut. You know, I, I at first I got really confused that, you know, he'd hit her thinking it was Nikki. Um, and then after she's just like, no, you didn't even touch me. And I'm just like, OK, now, yeah, movie, you've lost me. That was really good to make me question what is real and what's not. The TV luring him in, you know, Debbie Harry's mouth on the TV is just really iconic. You know, the Rick Baker and the special effects of the way the TV comes alive, the heavy breathing and then just his head. As he presses in, I like the the uh, the effect of when he goes to see Barry with the helmet. You know, at this at this point, the stuff you've seen in Videodrome has gotten so weird that you're kind of just accepting anything. You'll forgive me if I don't stay around to watch. I just can't cope with the freaky stuff. Uh, my n next favorite scene is uh, when he, like said, with Harlan and the hand grenade. Just uh, all the sequences with the stomach videotape going in. The videotapes themselves just breathing, you know, the pulsing they're, they're, videotape they're is alive creepy. and they're, they're great special effects to make you even, they look plastic, but at the same time, they're supposed to be plastic. Yeah. So it's like living plastic leading up to the TV exploding at the end. You know, it's a, such an iconic shot of just this old TV. And even now, nowadays, when we've got the thinnest, biggest TVs we could. Could you imagine Debbie Harry's mouth <laughs> just on like a screen, well, just it, heavy breathing it, at you? Like the, you could just have masses of people just marching. The into only the other TV. Scre screen that has any comparison is the ring. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yes, again, it's yes. playing to the same principle, which is t there is an undertone in that film, which is a bit more the, subtle, the, I'd argue. Which is the horror of television, which is the, the ring, point. The ring is a the ring is another le I think another level of horror where it's just her spirit 
And I suppose you could also say that that is what Videodrome is well, but Videodrome I don't think is alive. The girl in the ring yeah. was alive, died, and had possessed the spirit. Well, again, Videodrome was created by. You've got to look at the underlying like you mess, said, yeah. an idea of these guys wanting to control or change. But if you strip it back, America. To the message, yeah, but if you strip you know, it back to the message, you end up with um, the same principle, which is there's poison to this kind of digital age where it's creeping out the television at you which is but but I mean, are they not the poison because they are using the television to try to anti-virus us well they're their own downfall in both, yeah in both team movies the the television is the downfall because don't worry about who has the motive to destroy you the television is the source of the destruction so it's more the idea that you know that um tv is a threat to you and anyone who believes that the tv is yeah the threat to you, it's like yeah. seeing that video that it'll get you killed as soon as you watch it and he's already doomed because he's seen the signal for this one videotape. It's the same principle. Yeah, they might come from different places, but maybe maybe they saw the cr- maybe they saw this. Yeah, maybe they I saw it. And thought, the you ring. Know what? I don't remember which year the original ring came out. I in. think it was ninety nine. So yeah, I thought it was after. Yeah, so you know, video drone was eighty three. Definitely, they, definitely. I think they could have well it. been influenced by Cronenberg. Yeah, I just came at it from a totally Japanese angle. Yeah. Um, but so, Jez, do you recommend David Cronenberg's Video Drone? I think I lean to just more so, yes, because I think, along with many things about this, it has a you can kind of digest it and enjoy it for the aspect that it's not cleanly interpretable. Yeah, it can be anybody's anything, which is true of any art. All art is fully interpretable, and this is dealing with the message that art is violence and art is horror and art is you know all these things, and like you've kind of got people trying to make good pornos early in the film and he's going for something darker and grimmer and more real and how real should art be um but again it is all again very much alice in wonderland because yeah. it is a man going down the rabbit hole and he gets lost in these dark fantasies now whether yeah. they're real or not again that's to the viewer's discretion to interpret but it's still a dark little fantasy that is very interesting to watch as a man is either just tripping totally into the darkest places, or he is a puppet to powers he can't truly defeat, and in the end, it consumes him. Yeah, totally. It's it's a it's an interesting film. I mean, I, I I have critique of it towards the end. I feel it loses itself in the plot, but I would overall say watch it. It is Cronenberg. He's a great director. The score's good. The actors are good. All the prosthetics great. Yeah. I, I'm 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 a bit of the same. I think you know, being uh, uh, being the same age as you, that like you know, that we come from the same generation. Where I definitely recommend Videodrome as a film lovers, you know, movie you have to watch before you die. You know, it's it's got everything you want. You've got David Cronenberg at his at his best. You know, would he get better from this? I you know you know I don't know, but. You know, at the same time, the special effects of Rick Baker, James Woods, you know, Debbie Harry, the storyline. Yeah, that's where my personal view comes into it, where I'm like, I'd much prefer to watch Existence, if I had to be really honest. But then maybe that's the gamer in me over the film watcher in me. I think as well that now that we live in a generation where everything is on our phone and everything is on the internet, Videodrome is kind of a parody you know kind of a joke that we would see this but then at the same time the the body horror just scares you to so much that you think you know maybe i should just step away from the internet for five minutes maybe i shouldn't you know try to get an illegal ips vpn to hack into some dark web network to watch something that i really wouldn't want to watch in real life but watching it through this screen makes it I, th- I think it was Tom Savini who said that seeing seeing dead bodies for a screen, you know, took away the reality of what you were seeing. And th- that's what I see with Videodrome. I-, I couldn't watch it again, really, if somebody said, if somebody put a flesh gun to my head, <laughs> you know, and said, you have to watch Videodrome, I'd be like, oh, can't we watch Existence instead, please? But if you've not seen it, you probably should. Yes, definitely. It, it rev- revs on it still. <laughs> Long live the new flesh. Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. Goodbye. Got 
something I want to play for you. 